reading the Bible for us today. If you guys don't have a Bible, please let us know. There are some Bibles outside on the welcoming table just as you came in. Um, otherwise, grab out your Bibles or you can follow along on the screen behind us. Today we'll be reading from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 12 to 30. I'll give you a chance to flick to it. Verse 12. When Jesus spoke to, again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. But Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would also know my father. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is this why he says where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you, you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Just as I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and I, what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. Hey, <clears throat> it's good to be back. Uh, we were in isolation during the week, and so if you're in, at, in isolation at home, joining online, we want to say hello. Thanks for joining us in the way that you can. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here as well, and it's a great joy to be jumping into the Gospel of John with you again. What do you think Jesus means when he says this statement with a promise? Here's his statement, I am the light of the world. And here's the promise, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Right? His statement, I'm the light of the world, and his big promise that goes with it, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Why don't you take uh, 30 seconds to a minute with the people on your table, ask each other, what do you think? Yeah, what does the statement mean? What is he promising? And then, We'll hear one or two answers, so uh, have a chat. <clears throat>
good to see you discussing this together. It's probably just long enough to get the brain thinking. It's a, it's a really interesting metaphor, isn't it? I am the light of the world. The first thing you go, oh, that's kind of, I know what he's saying. You go, I, know, I, know, I know what he's saying. Then you try and explain it to someone, and you're like, I've got no idea how to put this into words. It's kind of easier to uh, visualize, isn't it, than explain. So is the promise. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, anyone want to offer a thought? Yeah, I'd love to hear some, some brave soul share something that was talked about in your table. It doesn't have to be the answer, but just a thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kathy just shared, I hope you hear that online, but that uh, the image of light um, over a rainforest where the plants grow up to get to the light, and it's only as they get to the light that they can flourish. Yeah, it brings life, doesn't it? Yeah. I wonder what you talked about. And as you think about that picture, Jesus being the light of the world and offering to anyone, whoever, whoever would follow him, this wonderful promise that you would never walk in darkness but have the light of life. I suppose it raises two questions, right? Do you believe it, right? Do you believe the statement that He is the light of the world? And do you want it? Like, do you want to follow Him and never walk in darkness but have the light of life? As as we try and think this through, today and as we look at John chapters 8 to 13, this is kind of the big theme we'll explore again and again. Jesus being the light of the world. The one who's coming can give people life and bring us out of darkness. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder just how would you describe this? Is it something like this? You know, Jesus is the light of the world. He's the one who will show you how to live and make your life work. He will push back the darkness of negativity. He'll push back all the things holding you back so that you can walk more victoriously, more successfully, more and more fulfilled in this life. Is that kind of what you imagine? You know, it's, the, it's the light that pushes back the things holding you back so that your life will truly work. And truly flourish. We're going to think about that as we come back to the end. Now, as Jesus speaks these words, what's happening here? Like, where have we entered into the story? Well, we're in John chapter 8, and I love you having your Bibles open in front of you. And he's speaking to uh, people in Jerusalem, particularly the Pharisees. Now, they were religious leaders in Israel, and As he meets in Jerusalem, there's a giant festival that's just concluded, the Festival of Booths. Uh, It's kind of like October 9 to 16. One of the big events where people would gather from Israel into Jerusalem and they'd celebrate the harvest and they'd remember how God had brought them through the wilderness and into the promised land. And Jesus has gone to the festival. He's gone there with his brothers and his mothers there. But he's gone secretly because his time's not yet come. And while he's there, he's popped up and everyone's talking about who he is. Who is Jesus? Is he the prophet like Moses from the Old Testament? Is he the Messiah, the God's chosen one like David? And the Pharisees are saying, no, he's none of these things. He's a blasphemer. He's an upstart. Arrest him and we've got to shut this thing down. And so that's kind of the, the context we enter into this morning. Jesus is still in Jerusalem, still speaking to the people, still being challenged by the Pharisees. Uh, And we're going to see, as we look at this passage, it's kind of three things happen. So first is, Jesus' claim that he's the light of the world is going to be contested. His claim is going to be contested. Look at that, verses 12 to 20. And then Jesus is going to press on the hearers that his claim must be believed. You see that next, verses 21 to 26. 
And then he's going to show how his claim is going to be proved at the end. So the claim contested, he's going to press on us why we must believe, and then he's going to show how this claim is going to be proved. And it's going to help us understand more what this statement means, I am the light of the world, and what it means to follow him. So have a look at uh, verse 12. Uh, Jesus brings, he speaks to the people again, and then we hear his claim contested, verse 13. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness, your testimony is not valid. Now, the Pharisees say, look, Jesus, you're standing up and speaking about yourself, but that's just not going to fly. Like, one person claiming about themselves that they are the light of the world, I mean, that's just not, that's not valid. Like, that doesn't fly. Um, you know, if anyone just stood up and made this claim, is it enough that they claim it on their own? Surely they need some other people to back them up. Surely they, they need some evidence if they're going to be believed. And especially if it's a claim that's this big, right? It's not a claim that I'm really good at my job. It's not, it's not a claim that I really like the AFL. Right, it's, uh, he's claiming, I am the light of the world. And, you know, I'm going to change your life, everybody's life in the entire world. Right? What, kind of, uh, what kind of evidence do you need to back up a claim like that? Like, you can't just say this on your own. You might think, there's other people that have made these big claims. Like, in a way, the, the Roman emperors, at, when Jesus was alive. So Julius Caesar um, turned the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, fought a civil war, became emperor, and then when he died, um, he was uh, deified. They said, Julius Caesar, he is a god. That was a fairly convenient claim because it meant that his, his uh, successor... Uh, Octavius, who became Caesar Augustus, got then, he got to claim the title, the Son of God. <laughs> and he was the one who was saying, yeah, Julius Caesar, he was divine. <laughs> and so there was another person in the world at the time of Jesus' birth, Caesar Augustus, who was known across the world as the Son of God. Right? There was a Son of God and everyone was to honor him. There was someone like this. And so what makes Jesus the one who should be believed? What makes it him be the one that can be the light of the world? They say, if you're just speaking for yourself, your testimony is not valid. They challenge him. And then he comes back with his reply. Look at verse 14. And it's a reply in kind of a few parts. The first part is, he says, I can be my own witness. I can be my own witness. Look at verse 14. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. Now, why is that the case? He says, because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. His first answer is, I can testify about myself because I'm the only one who really gets me. And not in a way that, you know, like a 14-year-old self was like, my parents don't get me, right? nobody gets me. Jesus is saying, no, no, you don't know who I am because you, don't, you can't see the fullness of who I am. I'm not like you. Right? Just before this, they're arguing about this Jesus from Galilee, which is the region in the north. We thought the Christ was going to come from Bethlehem, a town in the south. He can't be the Christ. We don't know where he's come from. He's like, no, no, you, you don't get it. You don't know where I've come from or where I'm going. You see, I've actually come from God, the Father. Later he's going to say, I've come from above. I've not come from this world. And I know that. Because I'm the one who is with the Father. I am God. And I know where I'm going. I know my own future. I know why I'm here and what I'm about to achieve and then what's going to happen after that. There are things I know about myself that, that you can't know because of who I actually am. And so I'm the only one who can truly know me and testify to who I am. You say, I can be my own witness. Uniquely, 
because I know where I've come from and where I'm going. But he presses further. He says next, it's also about his ability to judge. He says to them, verse 15, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one, but if I do judge, my decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. You see, he makes first a distinction about where he's come from and where he's going. It says, I'm the only one qualified really to know me because of who I am. But even more than that, I'm also the only one who can make a true judgment. He says to them, you guys are limited. You judge according to human standards. Or if you've got another version of uh, an English translation, you judge according to the flesh. You, You judge like people, right? And you've got all of your limitations. Your limitations of your perspective, your experience, of your intelligence, of the evidence in front of you, of what you know. But even more than that, you've got the limitations of your heart, of what you will and won't accept, of what you will and won't believe. You know, next week, come back and hear what Jesus says to them about why they won't believe. It's a spiritual reason that is shocking. You've got to come back next week. And Jesus says to them, look, I don't judge that way. I don't think he's saying here, you know, I don't, I don't judge at all. Because you'll see just later on he says, you know, I've got much to say in judgment of you. Now he's saying, I don't judge like you judge. I'm not limited like you're limited. Now you judge according to your human perspective, you're your limitations of the flesh. But I don't judge that way. When I judge, my decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. See, Jesus says, where do you stand when you make your judgments? You stand there with all the other people. Where do I stand when I make my judgments? I stand with the divine because that's who I am. I stand with God. And we judge the way we see things, which is perfectly And so I am qualified to be my own witness. I can testify about myself. Not only that, if you took me to the court of appeal, the highest one you could reach, you know, you take it above the land, above the supreme, if you take it to the divine, if you take it to God, he would say, yeah, (laughs) he's judging rightly. But then thirdly, he, he addresses the issue... It's not fair if you are your own witness, you alone. He says to them, verse 17, In your own law it's written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And so here he says, look, I can validly appear as my own witness. I'm the only one who knows me in the way that is truly knowable (laughs) in a way that you can't because you don't know where I'm from, where I'm going, because you you can't because of your limitations of your perspective, because you're human. But you know what? I'm not here on my own. I stand with the Father who sent me. This is Jesus speaking to them. saying, that's who stands with me. That's who testifies to me as well. And we've seen this throughout John's Gospel, and we'll see it some more, the way that God the Father testifies to his son, that his son truly is, I am the light of the world. You see this at the start as God the Father sends John to prepare the way for Jesus, and he speaks about the coming of the Lord. You see this in Jesus' baptism, as God speaks and announces, here is my son. But principally, we see this in the words that Jesus speaks. Everything Jesus says, he says, I'm not just saying these things, right? I'm not just, I'm not just speaking to you clever, religious, helpful things. I'm actually speaking the very words God the Father has given to you. And the things that I'm doing, these signs that I'm performing, I'm not just doing impressive things. I'm not just feeding thousands of people. I'm not just healing lepers and opening the eyes of the blind. I'm doing specific things. I'm doing the works that the Father has given me to do. And so the Father is testifying to you through me every time I speak, every time I act in these works. The words and the works that I do, they are the things that the Father does through me. 
and they testify to who I am. That's why you should believe me, says Jesus. Because when I'm testifying to you, the Father himself is witnessing. And so they ask him then, they keep the contest going. Verse 19, they ask him, well, produce your witness. (laughs) Where is your Father? Where is he? Bring him out, let's have a chat. Verse 19. And he goes to them, You do not know me or my father. Jesus replied, If you knew me, you would know my father also. Now you can see, can't you, if you're kind of following along, that this is the great issue. If Jesus is God the Son, who's come from the Father to the world, and he's returning to the Father. And they're saying, look, Jesus, go and, go and produce Joseph. Go and get Joseph and bring him along. You know, your mum's here at the festival. Your brothers are here. Where's daddy? And they're like, no, you just don't get me. You don't, you, you don't understand who I am, where I'm going, where I've come from. You, but the implication is there too, right? If you did, if you did know me, then you would know my Father as well. If you did, then you would know my Father as well. Now, as you hear that, how do you weigh Jesus' testimony? Right? Do you accept what he said? Do you accept it? Do you think, yeah, he's the one who can make a good judgment about himself. His word is something I would trust. The work, the testimony of God the Father through him, I believe. I can see that. Or are you sitting there skeptically going, how can you appear as your own witness? <laughs> that just doesn't make sense. Now, we've had a lot of experience in the last couple of years of weighing testimonies to the truth, haven't we? It's been a lot of what trying to live with a pandemic has been like. like how do you know how to behave in a pandemic? Do you get vaccinated? How, what risks should we take or not take? How do we weigh up uh, you know, what our responsibilities are? Whose advice do we listen to? All the time we're weighing up testimony. We're weighing up the authority of someone who's speaking to us and we're trying to make decisions about what to do. And I wonder, as you've gone through that process, whether you've realised that actually it's pretty hard sometimes to be a fair judge of information <laughs> and to actually make good decisions. You know, we, we can imagine ourselves as fair and neutral judges but I feel this all the time, like I'm going, oh, I realise that I just don't know that much or I can't test everything out myself or my decision making is, is limited and flawed. We see this all the time in the last couple of years. Uh, I, I was thinking about this um, last night. Um, <laughs> people get decisions wrong all the time, right? Weigh people up and evaluate them incorrectly all the time. Michael Jordan, right? So, greatest player ever to play basketball. Six uh, NBA titles, five league MVPs, face of the NBA, face of Nike, highest paid athlete in the history of the world, right? So, he's earned $2.62 billion, adjusting for inflation. Now, coming into the NBA, they hold a draft where teams um, have a, an order of picking the new players to join their team. And... Uh, when Michael Jordan entered the NBA, he'd come out of a college career where he was college player of the year, he won the Naismith Award, he won the Wooden Award, right? So he was he, he did like game-winning plays, like he was a celebrity in college. Where do you think he was drafted? What, what, was the, what pick was he? was he? Was he pick one? Obviously. No. Became a larger one. Was he pick two? No. They picked Sam Bowie. He was picked third by the Chicago Bulls. And only after they tried and failed to trade the pick away for some guy called Jack Sigma. <laughs> you know, like, all I'm saying is we can look at someone <laughs> and judge them, and we can be horribly wrong, can't we? We can be horribly wrong. Now, Jesus here is calling us not so much to trust our own judgment, right, but to trust his to trust his testimony about himself and have that as the basis of our confidence that he is 
who claims to be, that he is the light of the world. Now, this raises an issue of highest authorities or supreme authorities. Like, how are we supposed to know Jesus is God? Well, because Jesus says so. <laughs> right? It's kind of a circular thing. How do you know Jesus is God? Jesus says he's God. How do you know that Jesus is God? Well, because he says he's God. <laughs> Why would you trust Jesus? Because he is God. Like, that kind of circular reasoning. So you think, why would, I, why would I believe you, Jesus? You're just testifying about yourself. But I just want to point out, that's the nature of all supreme authorities. When you get to the level of the highest claim, it can't be any other way. So it's not a logical problem in itself. In fact, it has to be the case that if you are the only one who can truly know you and testify to where you've come from and where you're going, if you are the divine then you are the one who is supremely qualified to testify about yourself and that your word would be the most trustworthy thing, right? It's actually logically coherent. But it also means you don't have to reject everything else that you need to know or could know about Jesus. My friend Ben describes, you know, if this argument about Jesus saying that he's God is circular, well, it's a roundabout with a lot of on-ramps, <laughs> a lot of ways to get onto it, right? It's all that you see about the reliability of the Bible. It's all that you see about the way that Jesus has changed people's lives. There's the way that the apostles who were with Jesus went on to testify about him, going from people who doubted and ran away to people who went and died for what they said that they saw, right? So there's all this stuff that fits, that gets you on the ramp. But the best testimony, the, the thing that should convince us, the thing that we are trusted in above all others is actually Jesus. It's actually his voice. It's actually what he says about himself because he knows himself in a way that we, we can't. And so what happens next? Well, interesting, it's what doesn't happen that John brings our attention to. He says, Jesus is speaking this in the temple courts. But no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. <laughs> so how did they respond to Jesus answering their challenge? Well, what they didn't do is seize him to kill him at this stage. But only at this stage, right? Because his hour had not yet come. It kind of casts a shadow over the direction Jesus' life is going. And as we look at John chapters 8 to 13, we're going from this point where the hour has not yet come to chapter 13 where the hour has come. As we see the light shine in the darkness, there's going to be a point where they do seek to seize him. So his claim is contested, but that's how he answers it. And I want to ask you, do you accept that? The second part is, Jesus presses on them why his claim must be believed. You know, he, wants, he wants them to know, he wants us to know. You can't sit neutrally with this kind of claim, this kind of testimony. Uh, and look what he says. So we pick it up at verse 21. I think he kind of says five things. And we'll read it first. But listen to what he says first. Once more, Jesus said to them, verse 21, I'm going away, and you'll look for me and you'll die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And this made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will indeed die in your sins. Here's His answer to them. He's saying, guys, you must believe my testimony. Why is that? Because first, the time is short. The time is short. This is an urgent thing. I am going away. The time I'm with you is temporary. So you need to believe. And the second reason is because you've got it wrong. He says, you'll look for me and you'll die in your sins. Now, I don't think he means, you know, you're going to seek me, Jesus, and fail to find me and die in your sins. So Jesus promises elsewhere in, in Matthew's Gospel that Anyone who seeks will find, right? It's the wonderful invitation of Christianity. If you are seeking to know God truly, he, you will find him. He is not hiding from you. So, but I think they, they've got it wrong here. He says, you'll look for me as in, they will look for the Messiah to come. They'll keep looking 
for the Messiah. Jesus is like, it's me. <laughs> You're going to look for me, but you won't find me because here I am and you're shooting straight over the top. You're like, get out of the way, Jesus. I'm looking for you. <laughs> right? They're doing that sort of thing. And it's like, because you, you look for me, but don't accept me in front of you, you're going to die in your sins. That's the consequence. That you, you've got it so wrong. And so he says, um, not only that, but you have to accept what I am saying now because where I'm going, you are not able to go. Right? I'm the one who's come from the Father to be the light of the world, to save the world, to go back to the Father. And where I'm going, you are not able to go. You can't just get there yourself. You actually need me. I am the way. This is going to go on to say, I am the truth. I am the life. If you ignore me, you won't go there. And so he says to them, you need me. You need me. You need me to come from the outside here. You need my voice. You need my testimony. He says, you're from below. I'm from above. You're in the problem. I'm above the problem. <laughs> you are from this world. I'm not from this world. You're, you're in sin. You will die. I'm not from this world. I've come into the world to be the saviour of the world. He is from elsewhere. If they reject him, they're stuck. We are stuck. And so he presses on them what they must do. He says, unless you believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Three times he puts this out. You will indeed die in your sins. First off, he calls it the sin singular, which I think summarizes the unbelief of the Jews. And that's the great issue with sin. It's not so much just the way we treat each other. The big problem of sin is our unbelief. that We will not believe in the one that God has sent. And out of that flows all kinds of things, all kinds of sins. He says, if you don't believe, you will die in your sins. Now, <coughs> I, I, I think this is kind of helpful to kind of picture this a little bit more. Hopefully this will help. You know snow globes, right? Just ima imagine a snow globe. A little Christmas village, some little like gnome people or something with hats and you shake it up and the snow falls. It's very majestic. Now imagine the snow globe is sitting there uh, on a shelf but the shelf itself is actually just very slightly tilted, <laughs> right? And at the moment, the snow globe's sitting there with enough friction, it's not going anywhere. But if it was to go somewhere, it would go down the shelf, fall off the shelf, smash on the floor, and all the little snow globe people would be kaput. So, you know, imagine you're, you're in the snow globe, right? You're living in a snow globe world. And then all of a sudden, everyone in the snow globe decides, we've had enough of doing life this way. Let's all run at the edge of the snow globe and see if we can get this thing moving in a slightly different direction. Let's get something to happen. So you all get together, you run, 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 dunk, into the side of the snow globe and it starts the slide. Right? But you're in the snow globe. From what you can see, there's the snow up in the, in the sky and there's the, you know, the winter village and the, the, what's the, the maypole and you're all having a good time in snowland. And uh, you know, from your perspective, the, what you see out there hasn't really changed at all. But imagine you're the shop owner. What do you see, right? You see all these little people in a snow globe go dunk and set themselves on a course for <laughs> plummeting off the end of a shelf to their destruction. What is it that the people in the snow globe need? <laughs> they need someone from the outside, someone who can see what's happening, someone who can actually do something to change the momentum of their slide, someone who's not of the snow globe world, to come in and rescue them, right? They, they, they need the rescue from outside. The, on their own, they can't do anything. On their own, they can't change anything. And Jesus is saying to them, look guys, it's kind of like that. You're of this world. You're from below. Your life is on a, caught up in unbelief. 
Because you refuse to believe in God, you will die. But it's not just that tragic, it's that you'll die in your sin. Which, as we explored last week, is a terrifying thing, an awful reality. They'll actually die, face the judgment of God and be condemned to hell. And so he says to them, you need the one from the outside, the one who can see what's happening, the one who can tell you the, the truth, the, the one who can arrest the slide, the one who can come and bring you life. And unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now when, when Jesus says that strange thing, right, it's a weird sentence, unless you believe that I am, that's a kind of a, an incomplete sentence, or oh, even I am he, we, we kind of add the he in to try and make it a, phrase that makes some sort of sense. It's, it's a strange sentence. What is he saying there? What is it that we're supposed to believe about Jesus? Well, the, the I am he at least points us back to the fact that he said, I am the light of the world, right? So the, you can add in the light of the world. But it's a bigger statement than that. It's, it's capturing up um, what God had revealed about himself from the Old Testament. Now, if you've got a Bible, keep your finger in John and flip back to Isaiah. If you're on your phone, just punch in Isaiah. Head head to chapter uh, 43. In Isaiah 41 to um, 53 or so, this is a big theme in the book of Isaiah. God is speaking to his people and he keeps saying to them, look, I'm going to come and save you. I'm the one who's going to come and save you. And I'm going to tell you about it and then I'm going to do it so that you know that when it happens... That was me who came and saved you, right? So you don't miss the point that I am the only God. I am your God and your Savior. So he tells them the future in advance. And so he wants them to know this so that they don't make up their own version of God, so they don't worship the gods of other nations. So if you look at 43, Isaiah 43, he says to them, verse 3, after speaking about his salvation, he says, For I am the Lord, or the capital Lord is the word Yahweh, I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In jump down to verse 10, after he talks about this salvation he's going to bring, he says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am, or that I am He. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me, I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I, and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. That I am out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Now, do you get the sense there? Like, God really wants his people to know, I am. I am God. I am your savior. And as he gives that title, I am, he's drawing on the way he revealed himself to Moses when he rescued his people from Egypt. That he is, I am who I am. This is the divine name. I am who I am. He says to Moses, go and tell the people, I am has sent you. And Jesus says, what do you need to believe? Who is it that's coming to you in this moment? Who is it that's speaking to you? It's I am. I am God. I'm here to save you. I'm from above. I'm not from this world. And if you don't believe, you will die in your sins. He's pressed upon them the need to believe. But it ends with them not understanding. See, even after he explains this, you jump back into John 8. They, they ask in verse 25, Who are you? And he explains it some more. And verse 27, They did not understand that he was telling them about his Father. And so I want to ask you at this point, do you know who Jesus is? Do you understand who it is that's testifying to himself? Because if you don't, he's saying the consequence is that you're on the slide, you can't rescue yourself, you'll die in your sins. 
But here is the one who says, I am the light of the world. Right in front of you. Speaking to you. But that's not where he finishes. Once they reach this point, they've contested his claim. He's pressed on them the need to believe it. Jesus hasn't finished. He wants them to know how this claim will be proved. When is it that they will know that he is who he claims to be, that he is the light of the world, he is God amongst them, their saviour? When will they know this? How will he be revealed? And the answer is surprising, right? It's shocking and it shapes everything. When is it? Look down in your Bibles. Verse 28. So Jesus says to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. When will they know? When will they know that Jesus is I am? It's when they have lifted up the Son of Man. (coughs) That's a strange thing to say. That image of lifting up the Son of Man is one of the great hopes of the Old Testament, right? It's this moment of spectacular glory that Daniel speaks about in Daniel 7. It's when one who looks like a Son of Man enters into the presence of God and receives all glory and power and dominion and he reigns over the kingdoms of the world forever. It's when where God's king becomes king of the nations in utter power and glory and authority. It's a great hope for the world, a great hope for Israel's king. But you notice, this isn't the moment when God lifts up the Son of Man. It's when they lift up the Son of Man. And Jesus has spoken about this as well. He said in John chapter 3 that the Son of Man must be lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole in the desert that everyone who looks at him may live, right? The moment that they lift up the Son of Man is the moment they lift him up to nail him upon a cross. And so he's saying, the moment you will know that I am the divine God come to save you is when you lift me up and nail me to a cross. And that in some way, that cross is the moment of glory. That is the hour everything is leading towards. This is the moment where God is revealed for who he is. This is the salvation that is being brought. This is when the light is switched on for the world. The moment when he's lifted up on a cross. And you've got to pause for a second and ask yourself, how can that be? Because when you look at a man crucified on a cross, what is it you're actually seeing? Like if you've, if you've, has anyone seen like some of the, the gospel films or like the Passion of the Christ? It is a horrific and, and brutal thing. Even to, to read about it is appalling. Like here's a, here is a man who is dying in great agony. But more than that, he's dying humiliated. He's, he's dying as a criminal first but as a lowly, scorned, despised criminal. Even at Jesus' death, everyone who saw him mocked him and hurled insults and people spat upon him and they put a crown of thorns upon his head to ridicule him. And not only was it just that he was humiliated and despised, it's more than that. It's that the cross signified that he was cursed. He was being cursed by God as a great sinner, bearing punishment and guilt. So you see him there in his weakness and his shame and his, his cursing. And you go, that, that is supposed to reveal God? The great I am? The cross? And friends, this is what we must see, right? To truly see Jesus who is I am. We, we, we must become theologians of the cross. And to be theologians of the cross, it's, it's a line I'm borrowing from Luther. He said, what we can be is we can be theologians of glory. You know, that is, we do our theology, our knowledge of God, by looking around at the world and saying, you know, there are powerful things in the world and God's like that but more powerful. 
and there's, there's beauty and there's, there's morality in you and I can see it and I can see the way you, that there are these good works being done through you and, and God is like that. He's like you, but more righteous. And so we, we start by looking around and, and go, God is like these things, but he's just better versions of them. He's more than that. He's the most glorious one. And the kind of God we end up with is, is a God of our imagination, basically. A God like us, but better. And then when we think about what he's like, we think about the power of God, well, we think about our power, but magnified. We think about the goodness of God, we think about our goodness, but magnified. We think about the justice of God, it's our justice, but magnified. But no, we have to see God through the cross. That it's actually at the cross where he reveals who he is. And Luther says, we must become theologians of the cross. That is, go, here is God's revelation of himself. Here's what Jesus said, I've come to do. And this is the point where you'll know me. And you'll see what I'm like. You know, we can, if we get this wrong, we, we, can't, we actually misunderstand Jesus. We misunderstand what it means to be the light. We don't see God. We get the Christian life wrong. We, we don't understand what it means to walk in the light of life. There's so many things that spill out of this. Yeah, I think about it with my friend Ben, right? My friend Ben, yeah, he's, uh, I'm sorry about the popping. I'm happy to switch to a microphone if that's helpful. Um, so my friend Ben uh, is a mixed martial arts and so, you know, does Brazilian jiu-jitsu to train. Uh, he plays guitar, he lives by the beach, he does CrossFit five days a week um, and he, he competes in CrossFit games. And you think, man... This guy's like strong and fit and musical and he must be really cool. And then you, you make this opinion of Ben, but like, I, I need to tell you something. Ben is an avid Warhammer collector, right? He, his most fun hobby in his spare time is painting little figurines and then moving them around to battle them. So if you didn't know that about Ben, you would actually completely miss who he is. You'd think he's really cool. In fact, he's a total dag. He's a complete nerd. But actually, once you get that Ben is a complete nerd, you actually understand the other things better, right? He does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because it's the most efficient way to do MMA. <laughs> he does CrossFit because it's so effective at balancing exercise with enjoyment, with motivation and friendship. Right? Thanks. He takes his nerdiness into his sports. Like, that's who Ben is. He's, he's got a mind that's sharp and driven for efficiencies and, and that's what actually motivates and shapes all of his different decisions. You miss the Warhammer, you miss Ben, right? You totally misunderstand him. You think he's cool. He's totally not. He's just a nerd. That's why I love him so much. We go out on holidays and we just play board games the entire time and then we watch people do CrossFit on, like, on the TV. Literally what we do on holidays. With Jesus, if you miss the cross, if you don't see that everything about him is something that's revealed through the cross, you actually miss who God is. Right? The power of God is expressed in weakness. The glory of God is in his humility. This is the God who's come to save us. Power revealed in weakness. Glory revealed in shame. The wisdom of God revealed in something that seems so foolish. Righteousness of God revealed in condemnation. Life revealed in death. Light is revealed in darkness. Blessing is revealed in suffering. The immortal God revealed in a crucified man. Creation is being revealed in destruction. Salvation revealed in a man perishing. A king revealed in thorns. The righteous one revealed in the place of a criminal. The cross takes what you assume about God and it subverts it. And it reveals to us the God who is actually there. Not the God of our imagination, but the real God. And this is his glory. Friends, you need to be a theologian of the cross to see God by what he reveals about himself there because Jesus says, there is where you will know me. All of my work is building up to this. All of my testimony is building up to this. 
And so this is what it's going to mean for me to be the light of the world. To bring light, not by like fixing the messiness of life, but by dying for the forgiveness of sins. To not make life easy, but through great suffering to bring blessing for eternity. To not set you on a path for glory right now, but in enduring shame for my name, receiving the inheritance that God has promised for me. It subverts everything and shows us that even the salvation that we're being offered, it's not something that you'd go and do, right? The Jews, you are not going to go. You are not able to go where I am going. You can only go there if I bring you. If you accept that when I die for you on the cross, I'm making you right with God. I'm making you children of God. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of his love that's going to create this in you. You need to believe me. Grab hold of the cross with both hands and be saved. This has massive implications for the Christian life, doesn't it? Think about what it means for suffering. If we understand that God is revealed through the cross, and that's how we truly know God, we also see something new about suffering as well, that in suffering is where God's blessing is. And so it makes sense that to walk in the light of life that Jesus is bringing now is not going to mean life just goes smoothly, that all your problems are fixed, that your aches are healed. It's that just as God blesses his son in the cross and glorifies him and reveals himself, he's going to work in your life in and through the suffering. He's going to bring you great blessing in that. You think of all the parts of the Bible that speak like that. Like that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. This hope doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Spirit. The way that God is the Father who disciplines those that he loves so that they would share in his holiness. And to not be surprised if you endure a fiery trial now. This is what the children of God go through. It changes the Christian life, doesn't it? It changes what it means to live in the light of the cross, to be a theologian of the cross. And so, friends, where we started, I want to say whether you're, you're a Christian or not, you need to see Jesus is the light of the world and you need to see that through the cross. And so, if you're not yet a Christian, that's the point to wrestle with Jesus, to look at the cross and understand what's been done there. And if you are a Christian, go, is the Jesus I know the Christ of the cross? And we're actually listening to what he says about himself and reveals about himself there. Or is he, in fact, the Jesus of my imagination? Where he's kind of like the great self-help guru, the great leader, the great helper of my life. He's like me, but a bit better. And he's going to make my life like it is, but a lot better. Because if you think like that, you miss the one who is the light of the world. You need to believe in the Jesus of the cross. Let me pray. God, our Father, thank you that you sent your Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. You did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, and we thank you. We thank you that you reveal yourself through your Son. And you do that at the cross. Oh, Lord, cast from us all of our made-up beliefs about who you are, our false ideas of who you are. Show us yourself clearly through the cross. Do this for our good so that we would enjoy what it is to walk in the light that Jesus brings, to never walk in darkness again, but have the light of life. And so carry us through our cross-shaped lives as well and into your eternal presence with exceeding joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.